Those of you that don't know me, Philip Moran's my name and I live here at Noosa Landcare. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Cubby Cubby or Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge Jason Lewis, uh, the president of Slow Food Noosa, and also the big cheese of Kalula Berries. We've also got Councillor Tom Wegner here tonight, so welcome Tom, and also Jennifer Nichols from ABC. Muzzles, I know they're a pain, but while you're sitting down and not moving around, I think we can demuzzle, but we'd like to try and minimise any further issues as much as we can. I know Robin's here from the distillery and a number of our businesses with my Chamber of Commerce hat on have had a lot of issues getting staff. So that's the reason that we want to try and do the best we can. So I'm asking you to stay still, keep your muzzles on if you can. When you're asking a question, you can take them off. In terms of housekeeping, toilets, uh, the ladies is behind the reception desk, uh, little boys is out on the veranda, emergency gathering point is out in the car park, tea and coffee at the back of the room. The format of this evening is we're going to a few words from Slow Food Noosa, either Rod or Jason, they're still fighting about who's going to take the microscone. Uh, Stuart Andrews from Forage Farms and Tarwin Park Training will be giving a talk on natural sequence farming. I'll have a few words towards the end about some of the stuff Noosa Landcare is up to and Alana Kelly will explain how you can get your hands on some dollars at the end of the evening. Um, what I'd like to do now is ask one of you two young fellas if you want to come up and say a couple of words. And I think you've got a booming voice, Rod. So what I'll do is I'll set this up with Stuart. Yeah, no more okay. uh, hi everyone, um, uh, my name is Rob Lees and I'm with uh, Slate Food Noosa, along with Jason, our president from Kalua Berries, my lovely wife Karen. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the concept of how this really started. Um, I was actually watching David Attenborough and uh, at the end of his, um, I forget the, what it was actually called, at the end of the the um, session, he said we can save the planet, but there's two things we've got to do. We have to set aside a third of the ocean and uh, set that aside for natural habitat and we've got to do the same with land. A third of our land has to be set aside for what he called rewilding. So I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how it's possible. Fortunately, um, we have a, a, a Noosa-based foundation that was interested in, in the same concept and so we got the Foundation and Slow Food Noosa together with Noosa District Land Care with the idea of providing some funds uh, for uh, producers and, and landholders in the Noosa area. But the catch is you've got to be one of our snail of approval recipients to actually get your hands on the dollar. Uh, and that we would do offer them the opportunity to do one of two things. One is to rewild or to revegetate. So to take a portion of your land that he's saying a third of the land or maybe a third of the property or a part of the property gets set aside for revegetation. And if we do that, well then the rest of the property needs to be working efficiently. So the second part of it was to make the land as efficient as possible for the production. And so hence tonight we have both the efficiency from the land point of view, the, re the, the um, making the land more productive with the natural sequence farming, and then also the, the revegetation from this district land care point of view. So that's the process, and um, we're really, really excited about being part of it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks to the Slow Food Noosa guys for inviting me along to speak, and for Noosa Land Care also. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give a, a presentation about NSF. But I've been told that I, I'm only allowed to speak for about 20 or 30 minutes. No, you can go longer than that. Oh, God, don't say that. Because I went and we had to do this new PowerPoint so that I could thin it right down so I didn't talk for... You think I could because I talk for hours, well, you, you know. Ask questions. You can ask questions, most definitely. That's, this is how I like it. I like to have it interactive. So I, I do have questions in here, but I wasn't going to 
leave you to answer them, but seeing I've got the time, I will leave you to answer the questions now. Now, what, we, what I'd like you to do is to think about the landscape. So think about what you see, and I know, how many of you guys are on a farm? A few of you, okay. How many people are living in town? You know, house, just an ordinary house block. So for the people that live in town on a house block, do you think there's anything you can do to improve the climate? Yeah, right, well, good. I'm glad you're thinking that because what I want you to do is I want you, to, I'm hoping at the end of this, you will realise that there's some really simple things you can all do to play a role, your role, in improving our landscape, improving our climate and improving the health of people. So... We set up um, Tarwin Park training originally because, you know, my time growing up with PA, Peter Andrews, who's my father, who some of you people may have heard of, he's a bit of a maverick, a rebel. I call him the sledgehammer. So as a sledgehammer, he comes in and hits people over the head. And, you know, you need that. The trouble is, after people have been hit over the head, a few times with the sledgehammer, they really get tired of it. So I'm the mallet, so I don't hit quite as hard as the sledgehammer. So what I saw watching PA trying to get this information out, I realised that his ability to take it to the next level was not there, and it was not his role to do that. So I had to step up. So we developed the training program, because I could see that people really didn't have an under a good enough understanding as to how you can implement this. So we started Tower Park Training in 2012. I'm sure you can all read, but I'll go through it anyway. Uh, in 2012, and it was, look, it's been a hard journey. It's like this forage farms. You start from scratch and you're trying to build it up. And, and so people have to learn a little bit about you as you go. And it takes a while. There's lots of slaps in the face, lots of ups, lots of downs. But anyway, that's the way it goes. And so as it says up there, our vision is to educate landholders on the how the landscape once functioned and how they can use natural sequence farming to emulate that. So natural sequence farming is not an idea. It is the Australian landscape, or any landscape for that matter, but we're in Australia, so we'll work with the Australian landscape. And it's about how can we fit our production systems into that landscape rather than forcing the landscape to do what we want it to do, which is what agriculture is all about. So you'll notice that I keep using these words that maybe you're not as familiar with, like farming instead of agriculture. I don't call it agriculture because agriculture has got us to the position we're at today. So we need to change. We need to look at how do we do it differently. So we're looking at, I call it farming. So we wish to create a hydrated, more productive and healthier landscape for all. And for anybody who's been out to visit forage farms, you can see a prime example of that. It is well hydrated, but that's how we want it. So this will lead into what um, Rod was talking about earlier. So it's the observation of how a landscape function based around three principles, an accumulation area, a production area, and a filtration area. Now, it was interesting what uh, Rod said about a third. So this is a third, this is a third, and this is a third. So those numbers, are how, it's what a landscape requires. Now, what we go, how we go about setting it up will be different in every scenario. But for these guys, for Noosa Landcare, who plant trees, and I had this discussion with Phil, that if we think about where should we plant the trees, where do you think? You tell me, where do you reckon we should plant the trees? Not you, Phil, you can't answer it. <laughs> yes? Oh, you're a cheat. You've, you've already been out and spoken to me. That's it. You can't answer any more now. But that's 100% correct. Why do you think we should plant the trees at the top? To attract the animals up there. Yep, that's one. Brian, what else? Drainage. Well, don't, we don't want to call it drainage, but yes, there is a movement from high up. That's exactly right. What are the trees doing up there on top of the hill? Are they building fertility? Because they're shedding material? So they're building fertility. What happens then with that fertility? It moves down. So if you're now building fertility at the top of the hill, everything benefits on the way down. Yeah? Where do we think about clearing the trees first? Top of the hill. Top of the hill. So you can pretty much say that anything we have done in the past 
just do the opposite and we're moving in the right direction. Yeah? It's not really that difficult. It's not rocket science, it's what we keep saying. So NSF's an ability to read the landscape, which is what I do, and I endeavour to, to teach people. Our sons are gradually getting a handle on it. That's what PA has the ability to do, to read a landscape and see the patterns and processes that set this landscape up. So the key is that plants managed water. That's what built the landscape. Plants are the engineers that build everything and the water is the carrier of the nutrients that feed them. This can be summarised into five key pillars and these pillars are ones that we came up with for our training program so that people could take away something very simple and if they can implement these five pillars, how they go about it may differ, but if they can implement these five pillars, they are moving their system up. So we've got slow the flow, let all plants grow. Who here would be happy to let all plants grow? Now you land care guys, you can't answer this. So we've got one, anybody else? Two, don't worry, you, not many people are happy to let all plants grow. Can Most. I their names and addresses? <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna go to their place next, are you? But it's very important and you'll understand hopefully at the end of this why it's important. So it's, it's a statement and it doesn't necessarily mean that all of these plants need to stay, but it means that you need to stop to think about it. Think about what that plant's doing. Care for where the animals go. What does that tell you? What are you thinking about there? Erosion. Possibly, yep. It's about management. All of these things are about management. It's all achievable. But this landscape, the Australian landscape particularly, evolved without the hard-hoofed animals that we run today. So they have been, or the management of those animals has been detrimental to the function of our landscape. So we need to understand that certain areas are sensitive to those animals, so we have to be careful when they're in those areas. Filtration is a must know. What's around here? How many of you guys live closer to the coast than Pomona? Okay. How many of you have actually been to the beach or at least to the out near the outlets? What do you think's a filtering plant there? Mangroves. Mangroves. Thank you. Yes, mangroves. What do we do to mangroves? Bulldozer. Build houses over the top of them. That is fantastic, isn't it? Really good idea. So this is how everybody's involved in this. Because if we're taking out the filter, the last filter before the water ends up in the ocean, then we're upsetting the balance of the system. And return to the top to recycle a lot. What does that mean? Pretty, pretty straightforward, really. Yeah. If, you're, if you captured what you, what you capture in the filtration area, if you take that back to the top, what's going to happen? going to flow back down. So how much did you lose in your production system? Zero. Nothing. That's what, how you have a, a system that works. So na nature once managed the flow of water, nutrients and matter over and through the landscape. That naturally slowing effect has been lost. So what we look at doing is what can we implement in there that can assist nature? So sometimes that could be some sort of construction with a machine. Other times it can be just plants. So how we go and put our plants in, where we put a fence in. All of those sorts of things have an impact on how water moves. What we want to do is we want to minimise the amount of water that's running off and maximise the amount of water that's getting into the soil. Yeah? It's all, once again, pretty straightforward. So let all plants grow. So tell me, who's got a, an issue with a plant? You've probably got an issue with multiple, but just spit some, send me some plants. Um, can't follow. Camphor laurel, yep. What else? Phil? Salvinia. Salvinia. Salvinia, a water plant, yes? Lantana. Lanta Lantana always comes up everywhere I go. Lantana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one? Mm. What's that one? The, the laurel is cat's claw. Oh, cat's claw, yes. Yeah, so we could, but we can look at all of these plants and we can start to ask a question what are they telling you? Now, I don't tell people whether they should or shouldn't kill a plant. All I ask them to do is to look at the plant and ask it the question, what is it doing? Why is it there? Because no plant just pops up just to annoy you. They all pop up for a reason. And quite often it's because we've upset the balance. We've probably removed the plant that used to do exactly that job. And so that plant and that one, the cat's claw, cre uh, cat's claw creeper, 
would have Etsy come into areas where once there would have been vines. But the vines, for whatever reason, either can't exist or get eaten by the, our animals that we use. So, perfect environment for that one. So it grows. So how are we going to fix it? We could spend our time running around poisoning it or pulling it out, or we could look at changing the way the landscape functions so that other plants will take its place. Just things that we can think about. So uh, why a plant is growing is determined by how that particular landscape is functioning at the point, that point in time. Now the thing is that you might see a plant growing here today, but this might not be the site that determines the reason for that plant to grow. It may be what's coming downstream. So something that's happening further up is causing that plant, the, the circumstances for that plant to, um, to grow. So giant rat's tail, everyone like that one? It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, well I can tell you, it, it likes low carbon soils and it likes it with no competition. Great environment for it to take off. How do you avoid it? Don't create that. It's pretty bloody easy really, isn't it? So every plant is building carbon, including giant rat's tail. So the giant rat's tail is building the carbon, so it will take it to a point where it doesn't need to be there anymore and something else will take over from it. The length of time is the only thing we don't know about. The end of the day, nature really doesn't care that we may only live till we're 80. It's just going to go about putting things in place so that that landscape starts to function. And if it takes longer than 80 years, bad luck for you, okay for nature. Yep. So the way our landscape operates is sensitive to the hard hoofed animals, as I mentioned. So we must understand that certain parts are highly sensitive and must be managed accordingly. To give you an idea of these areas that we consider sensitive, has anyone walked down a creek and seen a pond and then what you would refer to as a riffle? So where water's trickling and then another pond. You seen that? Yeah. Well, what the riffle part or the start of the riffle is what we call a step. And it's that step that forms the pond. If you get out, well, particularly cattle, more so cattle than, than sheep, but if you had cattle on one side of the creek and they wanted to get to the other side of the creek, what part would they use to cross? Step. The step. They'll always choose the step to cross. So when, if those animals are allowed to do that, they make that point vulnerable. The next time we have a flow, potentially the step could be cut out, our system no longer works. Yeah? So it's not hard, we can get around all of these things, it's not difficult to do. We just gotta first of all think about it. So the filtering the water, the nutrients before it leaves your landscape is imperative. So this landscape was set up with wetlands all over it. We've lost, I'm just trying to remember the number, I think it's 700,000 wetlands on the Murray-Darling system alone is what we've lost since settlement. So all of these wetlands which used to do all of these roles, filtering the water before it left. And you could be right up on, high up on a hill and in a flow line there'll be a wetland. Might only be little, but there's a wetland and it's functioning. So they've, they're missing. So we now need to look at reinstating those so that we've got this filtering process taking place all over our landscapes. So all, all landscapes need to operate in a continuous feedback loop. So that's what we talked about. How do we get the nutrients back to the top? What's some ideas? We've come up with the trees. What else are the trees going to do? If we put the trees at the top of the hill, what else is going to happen? It's shade, which will pull the animals up, as yep. said. So the animals that we're, that we're running. We and food. Cycle. What else is it going to attract up there? Birds. Birds. So we've already said, I've already said, that we didn't have the, have the hard hoofed animals prior to um, white colonisation. So therefore, why, what did that before? And it was the birds. So this was happening with the birds all the time. Even our native animals will always choose a place to go if they've got a predator, they'll choose a place to go where they can see the predator coming. That's high up. So a lot of animals die up on the hill, therefore the fertility is moving. We've broken that system. As farmers, I could go just about anywhere and I'll guarantee you, when a farmer has a dead cow or a dead sheep, they stick it in the gully. How many people have seen that? Yeah? So that's just fertility that you're just gonna wash away, bye bye. All the fertility for that animal, if that animal was taken to the top of the hill, that fertility is gonna make its way back down and grow more plants, make the farmer more productive. But we've all done it, you know? We've just gotta stop and think, hold on, there's, there are things that we can do. So any bit of fertility. If you're in your, who grows vegetables in their, in their backyard? How many people use raised beds over 
digging in the ground. Yeah, okay. Raised beds are good for your back, bad for everything else. The reason for that is that you, you're forcing your plants to fight against gravity all the time, every day. Because every time you water them or it rains, it pushes all the fertility to the bottom. Now they've got to work to bring it back to the top before they can even grow. See? Where if you use the ground, get down on your knees, providing you can get back up again, get down on your knees and farm down there and set your landscape or your garden up so it's in going with the slope doesn't matter how big or small the slope is and you take your put your pile of mulch at the top of your garden and then you do rows of mulch that and then water the the garden only from the top through that mulch that will feed all the liquid compounds down through and water your garden from one spot you don't leach any nutrients that's how this Australian landscape worked so if you were trying to piece that back together that pile of mulch was a wetland you just created a wetland at the top of your slope with fertility, which is now feeding your landscape, which are your vegetables. Then, when your vegetables are finished growing, if you're growing them in rows, you take the row of mulch, which is the plants, and you place them one step up, which means now they're the fertility to feed the next round of vegetables. Which means you just move the, it, whatever that plant took to grow, apart from what you harvested, you moved it up there so it can now feed back through again. But what do we do? We pull it out, we take it somewhere else and we burn it or compost it and whatever. I don't know, we move it. So if we just move it up, then it'll feed the next round of plants. So natural landscape function. Our landscapes are naturally self-sustaining. It's designed in such a way that it was capable of sustaining itself over periods of both dry and wet for millions of years. We seem to forget that. This old landscape, 600 million years old, it's the oldest, flattest, driest, inhabited landscape on the earth. So it's managed to survive for 600 million years without people. So people have been here, or humans have been here, supposedly for about the last 120,000. So in that last 120,000 years, and more so in the last 230, we've managed to undo all of these processes that built the landscape that we see today. So we've got to go back, understand that, understand what the, the patterns and processes were that built it, reinstate those and it will just build itself because it did it before and it can do it again but guess what it did it with every plant every plant there was no discrimination between plants so natural landscape function and natural capital are intrinsically linked so i'm thinking about i don't know whether you guys have you heard about natural capital you heard people talking about natural capital can anyone give me an idea what natural capital is Well, we can go with water. That's natural capital. What else? I'd call my carbon content. Definitely. Carbon, yep, that's natural capital. And the soil that's in around the carbon as well. What else? Biomass. Biomass, sure, yep. Rainfall. Rainfall. Nice trees. Sunshine. Nice big trees. Nice big trees, they're definitely part of your natural capital. Sunshine. Sunshine, yep. See, so you're starting to think about it. But the thing is that there's, there's two key ones, and we'll go through it shortly, and it'll make you start to think a little bit more about it. So to build natural capital and restore our natural landscape function, we need to ensure we are preventing the losses of water, the losses of energy, and the losses of matter, all due to gravity. So give me some ideas. What would we, how can we go about preventing the losses of water? Swale, yep, most definitely. What else? Leaky weirs. Leaky weirs, yeah. Geez, you wouldn't want to say it. You better be careful where you say that word. That could be outlawed, but yeah. Um, wetlands. Yep. Natural wetlands. Yeah, all those things. Even as simple as putting a piece of mulch on the ground. Rocks. Anything. Anything is going to assist with that. So how are we going to avoid the losses of energy? Trees, shade. Yeah, possibly. Taking them out or putting them in? Taking them out. Stop taking them out? Stop taking them out. Good. I'm glad we clarified that one. We're on the right, we're on the right page. I was thinking you are in the wrong room for a minute. We were in the land clearing room. You're sitting next to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dangerous place to sit. <laughs> so the losses of energy, um, what else can we do? I guess whales can do the same thing, but not. 
Could be, yeah. Yeah, 100%. There's a massive amount of energy in water. Water is hugely destructive. When we only saw that, for anybody who saw the most recent um, rain events out to the north of us, north of Gympie, I mean, th that's hugely destructive. So when, when our system becomes dysfunctional, then we have things like that happen. And if our landscape is not in a position to be able to handle it, then we get major problems. So we get erosion. There's one other one that I want you to think about with energy, and you talked about the one that I'm after, so, but I want somebody else to come up with it. So he talked about, Ryan talked about sunlight, but I want, to, I want you to think about how are you going to manage it. Maintaining the green vegetation. Green, thank you, green vegetation. Very good, 100%. It's exactly right. So the losses of matter, if, we, if we're working on the top two, we're automatically going to prevent the losses of matter. Yep. So gravity, how many people thought about gravity? How many people wake up every morning and go, geez, I'm going to work towards managing gravity today? <laughs> no. no, nobody does, do they? But that's also one of your, that's natural capital. That if it's not managed, it can be destructive. So what's powering that water that you're talking about? Gravity. gravity. So the water's nothing without gravity. It's only the gravity that moves it, then it becomes a problem. So we're working on managing gravity. So water is the basis for all life on Earth. Energy from the sun drives all life on Earth and carbon is the building block for all living things on Earth. So the best solution for major climate recovery has been with us from the very beginning. All the answers are there. You want to fix the climate? All the answers are there. We've just got to actually start to understand it and do it. Easy, easy. So we got to the question part, which some of the questions you've already answered. So we'll see how you go with this one. I'll let you answer these. What are the two free energies that run your farm? Tom, you can't answer these because you might already know the answer. I've already given you the answer anyway. But I, yeah, you want me to give both? Or I no, you can't be greedy, Brian. You can only give okay. one. I'll go with the sunshine again. Sunshine, yep. Sunlight? Water? See, it's funny, everywhere I go, it's always the same answers. Sunlight and water, but water's not an energy. We discussed that. Remember, water is being moved by an energy. It's not an energy. So what's the one that's moving it? Gravity. 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 Thank you. So they're the answers, sunlight and gravity. So as a farmer, if you wake up in the morning and go, right, how am I going to go about managing sunlight and gravity? I'll bet everybody does that. No, they don't. But if you do then all of a sudden you change the way you go about your daily chores. Yeah? So if you can tick off that I am managing sunlight the best I possibly can and I'm managing um, gravity the best I possibly can, would that involve having any plant that was green and growing? Would any plant be carrying out those roles for you? You see how we can't afford to discriminate between plants? If we've got a plant, it's green, it's growing, it's managing those two, and it's not sending you a bill. Yep. So we have to ask those questions. So what can we do? We can, we tie this back to our pillars in how we work to, with the natural capital. So we slow the flow, we let all plants grow. So we make use of the free energy that you receive every day and put it to good use. Use it to grow plants and manage your landscape. This is how a landscape works. We just forgot that that's how it works. So how do you assess your basic farm productivity? Come on, you wanted questions. You wanted to answer questions. I'm giving you questions. You've got to answer them. Fire it out. I don't bite. Percentage of ground cover. Yep, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thank God. So the total green surface area of my farm, the conversion of sunlight energy into plant biomass and organic matter in turn, of course, that will be carbon in the soil. So, we'll go back again. I'm going to keep harping over it. Do you think every plant plays a role in that? In its place. In its place. In its, in its place. Oh, yeah, a plant in, in, what, in its right place? Yeah. No. It doesn't matter. If it's green and growing, it's doing that job. 
It's only in its place if you don't like it there or you do like it there. Can I just question that because I mentioned my camp for laurels. Yep. What I notice, you know, when you get um, uh, monoculture of camp for laurels, you get very bad ground, yep. which eliminates a lot of that. Yes. So I, that's one of my dislike of them. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, yes, it's doing a function, and it's doing quite a lot of. Yes, no, it's great. It's that's good, but is the camphor, camphor laurel there of its own choosing or did it only turn up when the environment was whatever, opened up and my suspicion would be it was cleared, which meant all nature tries to do is to cover that ground and it doesn't care what it covers it with, it will put a plant in there. Now, I will ask you a question and is there anywhere in the world you've seen a monoculture survive over a long period of time? Let's say it's camphor laurels. Does that answer the question for you? If there's nowhere in the world already that one plant hasn't dominated that ecosystem or that landscape, then it can't happen. We've only been messing the place up for the last couple of hundred years. Isn't it? That, that's right. Yeah. But that's what's caused it. it. Ultimately, if you left it as it was, what's to say Campbell Oral didn't become a monoculture? Well, because you can't. That's what I'm saying. If you look any landscapes, and you know, this landscape's 600 million years, of, years old. So if something was, one plant was going to dominate a landscape, it would have done it by now. Well, they weren't here then. Careful, Oros, doesn't matter. Mm. We don't know that anyway. I mean... The what, sorry? The yeah, but is it not the management of the landscape which allowed them to dominate? We can go into that, certainly. Yeah, they've dominated the landscape. Eucalypts used to be 2% of a rainforest. So you choose from that whatever you may. If they were 2% of the rainforest, why are they not now? human interference more than likely. I'm getting the signal from the back. I was given more time, so it's okay. <laughs> so let all plants grow. That's how we work with that one. So the more plants you have growing, the more effective you are at using the energy we receive from the sun every day, free of charge. So the camphor laurel, any of these plants have only started growing there or have dominated that area because of what we've done. So do we just go, Pfft. okay, bulldoze it or just go, leave them there. No, we look at it and we find out why. Maybe what we need to do is we need to do a bit of work. Maybe we do a bit of thinning of the camphor laurel to open some light up so that we can get an ecosystem working again. There's ways of going about it, but it doesn't mean that we go in there and just wipe out an entire area, poison everything, no. Because at the moment, we've got a tree and if you measured We'll use the camphor laurel. If you measure the green surface area of that camphor laurel compared to the space of the ground that it's taking up, you'll find that it has got far more green surface area than any of the grass that would grow in the same area that it's occupying. Yep. So if we... Just going back to John's question about it, and we'll, we'll you know, have a bit of discussion about it later, but the allopathic effect that some of these plants have what Brian said has been my experience too, that under a lot of big camp for laurels is nothing. Mm -hmm. And hence, you know, you get... Under eucalypts as well, mm -hmm. but you're probably not clearing them out. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen that. See? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, massive. Oh, and I have not seen the same level of bare earth under eucalypts as I have. Yeah, you, you just travel out into... The, you might be along the coast here, and you, rain's forgiving. You move out... It, go over the range and have a look. You'll find ground that is caked rock hard yeah. under a eucalypt monoculture. Not only that, it's killed everything below it as well yeah. because the toxins that come out of eucalypts leak down it with the water because we know that everything moves downhill and it kills everything below it as well. So yeah, look, anything as a monoculture is not healthy. You're not going to get any argument from me there. Nothing as a monoculture is healthy. But we've got to ask the question, why is it a monoculture? That's what I want you to ask. Ask that question. So what's the purest and most readily available water for your plants on your farm? Rain. Rain? Anything further on rain? Groundwater. Groundwater. Groundwater? Yep. Anything further on groundwater? I'm still searching. Well, we get 35 mil Jews every day. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are gone to the top of the class, Brian. Yes, it's due. How many people wake up every morning and think, I really need to get my landscape working so I've got dew. No, nobody thinks about that. 
even to the point where a farmer in the middle of a drought, he walks out the door and around the house because he's either he or his wife likes to have green areas around the house. They walk out in their bare feet and they're walking through wet grass. Then they walk outside the fence, out the gate, and they're kicking the dust. What was the difference? Green, green plants. Green plants. So dew is worth anything from 30 mils up to three or 400 mils to you per year. So if you grow green plants, you are getting moisture back every day or every evening that was lost during the day before. No green plants, no dew. System dysfunctioning. Now, the other important component of that is the fact that the way someone said rainfall, the dew only forms on plants. So it condenses on plants, which means it has no ability to carry away your environmental capital, which is your fertility. Whenever it rains, it has the ability to carry that away because we know what's powering it, Alana? Gravity is a powering it. So it has the ability to carry that away. Dew, no. Dew forms on the leaves of plants. Some of, the, some of it is taken up by plants. Some of it trickles down the stem onto the soil to feed it later. What do you think the most efficient plants are at capturing dew? Trees. Maybe, depending on the type of tree, but I'm going for something else. It's actually, no, it's not grass. You'd like to think it was grass. It's not grass because everyone wants it to be grass. It's actually prickly plants. So any plant that has a spike or a point, so dew forms on a point first. Have you seen that? You've seen a thistle with a dew drop sitting on the end of the, end of the prickle. So that's where dew forms first. So all of the plants that have spikes, that could be a little hair underneath the leaf. What sort of plants do you think they are? What, are you, what would you call them? Because I, I just call them a plant, but I know you've got a name for them. What would you call them? I call them paws. Oh, that's cheeky. <laughs> that's not really true. Now tell me what you really call them. Some would call them weeds. Some people would call them weeds, yes. So those plants are the most efficient at capturing dew, which is why they survive and everything else dies. Once again, we go back to all plants. So we need to have all plants as part of the system. That's the, the small water cycle. If we have the small water cycle working correctly, then guess what? That influences the large water cycle, which is the evaporation over the ocean, water coming onto the land, rain events, which is what we've upset. So as soon as we get into a dry period on the land, you could watch, once again, you guys here on the coast, you're a little bit, um, removed from this, but if you went inland, you could watch a beautiful big black cloud moving over the top of you in the middle of a drought, and it comes over here, and you see it as rain at the ocean, over the ocean. Why? Because it's actually cooler over the ocean than it is on the land, because we've dehydrated the land with no green plants, so it's too hot to rain there, so it rains over the ocean. Not very helpful, is it? So all plants are helping to cool our landscape, attracting rainfall. So you're seeing it now. Anybody who's been watching the weather systems, you saw, uh, first of all, Victoria starting to get good rains a couple of years ago. Then it moved to New South Wales. Now it's moved to Queensland. Now it's out in the centre. So South Australia has just had big rains and Western Australia this week have just got rains. So what does that tell you about the, situ the climate, the situation we're going to be going into for the next year or two. It's going to be wet. But guess what follows a wet? A dry. And the reason for that is because we have ineffective rainfall because we don't grow enough plants so we dry our landscape out and we go into a drought. Anyway, I got off the track a little bit which is not that unusual. So what do we do? What, how, do we, how do we solve that problem? We let all plants grow. Again, Every plant is going to carry out that process for, it, for us, so we're not discriminating because we want everything, every plant to do that role. I mean, how many times have you seen somewhere, well, I mean, it happens, it's still happening today, unfortunately, where a farmer decides that he needs more um, land to get more production, so he clears an entire forest. 
Now, there's plenty of data out there today that shows that you'll actually be more profitable if you just thinned the forest and allowed more sunlight in, because then you can grow vegetation at this level, so your camphor laurels, you thin those camphor laurels, open the light up, and you can start to get cover on the ground, which means you've got green surface area on the ground, plus this layer of green surface area above being the camphor laurel. Now, maybe what you want to do is move towards less camphor laurels and more of some other sort of trees into the future. But for the moment, if they're green, they're growing, they're doing all of these things. Don't remove them all. How do landscapes maintain their fertility and carbon balance? I've already given you the answer for these. It's really, really simple. Edible and inedible plants together. Why do you think you would want to have inedible plants? Maintain cover. Maintain cover. Yes? As, yeah, stay consistent. Because if we had everything edible, then everything would rely on man or human. Guess what the last species you would want to rely on? <laughs> human. Yes. So if we have everything that's edible, guess what we're going to do? Eat. Eat it. How much of the system with the dew and so forth are we going to be carrying out if we've eaten everything? No. So we need to have a balance. So having a balance of all of these plants is hugely beneficial. So again, let all plants grow. Just keep rolling through it. In Australia, are high water tables in farming systems beneficial to productive outcomes or detrimental? Throw me an answer. You can only have two. Yes or no? Don't be scared. Just throw it out there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Glad someone said, said an answer. Yes, but they're beneficial when they're managed correctly. Because when not managed correctly, they can actually be detrimental to production systems, which is not so good. But Australia was naturally naturally had very high water tables and only in the last, well more so in the last 230 years as a result of our drainage and our erosion, we now no longer have water tables. If you were to come out to forage farms, I could dig down anywhere and show you a water table on top of a hill. It was not there five years ago. It's not hard to do. We can restore it back. We just have to understand how we go about it. And we have to be prepared to let all plants grow, which we do. So what do we do? We slow the flow, let all plants grow, and we be careful where the animals go, and we'll be able to tick that one off. <clears throat> so this is one of the, some of the things that we do. This is actually working on a flow line. And so this was PA did this, the work on this particular property uh, back in 2005. So this is what the creek looked like. Looks pretty healthy, doesn't it? Just how you'd want a creek to look like? Yeah. Nobody's saying anything, so you must think it's okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what people believe is normal. That's not normal. This particular area, that's a floodplain. That had no flow line in it at all. Water just spread across the floodplain flood whenever it rained. So what was happening? We weren't managing the water or the gravity that was moving it. So PA came in, he put a a leaky weir in at this point, and just there is a willow. Now, you guys probably aren't familiar with willows, but down south, they're hated about as much as your camphor laurel, okay? But it happens to be a vital plant to help rebuild our water systems. We just have to understand that they're there to play a role, and then they disappear. That might be 30 or 40 years, but so long as we're improving the system around them, they just disappear, and they get shaded out by other plants, eaten by grubs, whatever. Once, they, once they're no longer needed, nature takes care of it. So this was three years later. Which one do you think looks better? It's exactly the same site, the one on the right. Well, I think that looks better. So how much green surface area is here? Not very much. What sort of plants are growing there? What do you think these ones are? Prickly. Probably prickly ones, I would say, yes. And over here, what sort of plants we got growing there? Grass type plants, so wetland type plants. Can you name the four basic functions of plants? Think really simply. Once again, 
given you all the answers, but think simply. If they're um, bringing back the Jew, what are they doing? I'll, I'll cut it short for you. I won't tease you. So they are solar-powered air conditioners. They are solar-powered factories, solar-powered pumps reversing gravity, and they are solar-powered soil carbon builders. So as a sol solar-powered air conditioner, when a plant, any plant, green plant, evapotranspires, when it takes liquid from the soil or from its leaves and converts it to, as evapotranspires it, it converts to a gas. When it converts to a gas, it traps heat. What's the one thing they're saying is an issue with climate change? Excessive heat. So is it possible that we actually have an absence of plants? So if we can, this is how nature managed that heat. It managed it through plants evapotranspiring, trapping heat in moisture, in water. What happens at night when the dew comes back? When the moisture comes back down, settles back down, then it releases the heat. Has anyone been in a desert during the day and then overnight? What's it like? Really cold. Really cold, really hot. Yep, why? Because you're in a desert? No plants. no plants. Thank you. There's the key. So if we want to eliminate plants, we start discriminating with plants. As long as we're happy to live in a desert, that's OK, because that's where you're going to live. If prickly plants are the only ones you can get to grow in a landscape because of what we've done before, that is better than no plants, I can assure you. Otherwise, we're in a desert. So solar-powered factories, so they're processing compounds in conjunction with uh, biology in the soil. They are solar powered pumps because they're drawing up moisture, they're drawing up nutrients out of the ground, so they're reversing gravity. Gravity is taking everything down or off. Plants are doing the reverse. Yep. And they are solar powered soil carbon builders, which you know, you're all hearing about that. So they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, transferring it down through, putting it into the soil, working again with the biology to capture that and store it as safe carbon. So what do we do? We let all plants grow. I'll skip through these next couple because I just did that fairly quickly. And I'll be getting, I've probably already had the one finger salute from the back telling me I only had a minute left, but I've missed it. Oh, yeah, and I'm getting this now. <laughs> Can you identify the natural landscape progression in all Earth's ecosystems? You've already answered it. I didn't hear that. Green. green? Yeah, well, that's a good one, but I'm looking for something else, a progression. Where were we taking the mulch to? Up the hill. Okay, so if we're taking the mulch to the top of the hill, what's going to happen as a result of that? It's going to come down. It's going to come down. So our ecosystems, the progression in all Earth's ecosystems are from a high point to a low point, from the mountain to the sea, from forestry to aquaculture. So if we think about this landscape, we have some forests. Well, we had a lot more, but we've still got some forests. Where's the aquaculture? Where's the pond? The big sea. The big sea out there is a big pond, isn't it? So this is one big landscape, and that's one big pond. And then all you do is simplify it back from there. So if you have one forest, that forest in your vegetable garden could be the pile of mulch and then down here where you grow your vegetables and below that you could have a pond, which means the fertility that goes from there gets used by the plants, anything gets lost from there ends up in the pond. You pump the pond back up to there, you lost nothing. See? So, but what we do is we get our fertility and we send it at a rate of knots down our flow paths, down our rivers and send it to the ocean. Well, the ocean says, I don't really want all of that too much. So it's dysfunctional. So everything builds from a high point to a low point. So if you want to do anything, always look at doing it at the high point first. And then everything will feed down from there. So you can start the process of building a landscape just by putting something on top of the hill. Trees, pile of mulch, manage the water up there, bang, it just builds. How long it takes, who cares? It's already building, does it all by itself. But we seem to think we've got to go and do all these things. So what do we do? 
We look at the filtration is a must know and return it to the top to recycle a lot. Simple. So you could have every farm set up so that it had forest at the top and a pond at the bottom and aquaculture. So the forest at the top could be trees that are producing a product, nuts, fruit, doesn't matter. They're still going to be adding fertility up there. They're still capturing um, fertility out of the atmosphere. And then down the bottom, that's where our fertility ends up. If we, the amount we lose, you can grow fish or whatever it might be at the bottom. And then everything else in between is another production system, whether you're cattle or whatever, it doesn't matter. We're so narrow-minded in how we go about our production methods. So to return it to the top, so this is an example at Taiwan Park, which was the property I grew up on at Bylong. So we've got a contour running along here, and every year I would take hay up. It's not hay to feed stock, it's not quality, it's mostly weeds. Didn't matter, whatever was growing, I would harvest that from a low area and I'd take it up and put it up high. This is up on the slope, and this is, I'll go back to where you, someone talked about the eucalypts before. These eucalypts here, all of this land down here was bare. It used to be bare and rock hard concrete. And we put a contour through here which intercepted the toxins leaking out of the eucalypt forest. And then we added fertility into here, which turned that area into a grassland, a healthy grassland. Just simple things. Understand what's going on and we can convert it around so that it functions well. So what's the common theme across all of these questions? Plants manage everything. So this landscape, if we all died and left tomorrow, this landscape would be in fine fettle because it's got plenty of plants and it will rebuild. So we spend all of our time toiling around, wiping out plants because we don't like this one, we don't like that one. At the end of the day, once we've wiped ourselves out, those plants are going to still come back and do whatever they need to do because that's the role of plants to build our system. So we first of all have to realise that plants build everything we've got today, everything in the landscape that is, and they can rebuild it. We've just got to work out how they did it and a system. And at the same time, we have to be able to create a production system, which we can do. So by implementing that natural sequence farming and restoring your natural landscape function, you are building natural capital, improving productivity and increasing your resilience to fire, flood and drought. 2019, do you recall the fires down south? What do you think the biggest problem was there? A match? Like too much vegetation. Too much fuel? Yeah. You heard that, didn't you, all the time. Too much fuel load, too much fuel load, too much fuel load. Bullshit. It's nothing to do with it. It's because it's dry. Because we've created a dry landscape. If you look at, you've got to look at things as a bigger pattern. So we've got a forest, forested areas which are now dominated by vegetation that must burn. It doesn't have a choice. It's only a matter of when. Because it requires fire to propagate, to create new life. So that vegetation now is focused around burning at some point in time. So it's going to burn. Then, to combine that, all of the land to the west, which is where our weather comes from, was all dry because of how we managed it. So we've created this massive um, example of how you can just burn everything to the ground, and that's what happened. So can we alter the forest? No. That's a lot harder to do. But can we change the way we farm so that our landscapes aren't dehydrated and dry Therefore, we don't have the hot winds and the hot air feeding those fires when they happen, because they're going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it, but you can change the surrounding landscape. So if you can change your surrounding landscape to be cooler, then the fires don't burn as hard. Ten years I was captain of the fire brigade in our local area down in New South Wales, and I saw fires go through were what they call crowning fires, when the fire just lifts straight up into the canopy of the eucalypts. And it's pretty scary. But that's all being fed from further away. It's not even the eucalypts that, well, they're obviously they're creating part of the problem, but they're being fed this hot air from further away. So we, can, we have the ability to change that. 
that's what you can do if you want to know anything more about what we do that's the way you can go about looking us up and if you're interested in um, I don't know come, come to Forage Farms and do a tour that's probably the easiest thing you can do come there and see how we do it because it's a it's a, an example of natural sequence farming with a production system laid over the top of it. Yeah, we'll we'll um, we put it on our. You can go onto our uh, Facebook page, Forage Farms Facebook page, and uh, Megan or Hamish will put it up when we when we do um, we're doing our next tour, which probably won't be till March or April. It won't be me or Megan because we've got to head south to run our training courses. But our boys, Hamish and Lachlan, who are very skilled at running um, running our tours, and they can answer any question you ask. They're very very. Very, very smart boys. I wish I was half as smart as them at, at their age, but anyway, it's the, you would hope that's the way things go. Are there any other questions? Because I'm done. Well over time, no doubt. I will say also on the farm tour side of things that we will be hosting an event with Stuart um, in July. I believe we end up with I don't know about her eyes, actually. Megan, do you remember I'm supposed to be doing that field day with Lisa Lankin? Because I can't remember. <laughs> So I think we've, we've um, booked it to be July, sometime in July. Yeah, so, I mean... So yeah, look out for that if you want to attend. Yeah, yeah that, that'll be... We'll, we'll talk about all the same sorts of things. We'll probably even more than we'll cover in the, at the farm tour, actually. We'll cover for the field day, because it's probably a slightly different focus. Yeah. Sorry, it all makes absolute sense, but you, you have different levels of degradation depending on where, where you are. So if you go across the range that way, you didn't land, right? You have to dry country. I've got friends out there. Um, come to Windy and Toowoomba and all that, which is completely different country. Out here, you can't help but have lots of green grass, right? So the grass is not a problem, the ground cover is not a problem. But in terms of following these concepts, um, you know, and generally around here, I think lots of people have got cattle and so forth, and I'm, I'm not sure everyone, because we've got slopes on our property as well. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure people want to go planting lots and lots of trees on the slopes. So I'm not quite sure how you... Um, integrate some of this into your sort of farm management plan. Um, if you've already got grass, you don't want the entire ridges covered in trees, right, for you know, various reasons. You don't? Oh, I don't. No, no. I mean, <coughs> you don't? But potentially us. It's not, not completely ruled out. But I'm saying, what, what other sort of things can you apply in terms of these, these concepts? So, because you want to keep open pasture, right? Because everyone's got, got cattle. Yeah, and, that's, and so that's what NSF is. It's about how do we get the landscape to function how it once did, but you still have a production system. So when I talk about the top of the hill, that's to make it simple for you, because you know that if you put something at the top of the hill, gravity is going to carry it down. So what we do is we'll go on to the side of the slope and we look for a step. And the step is where a wetland used to be in the garden, right? And so we would use, we would put a, a contour. Someone talked about, mentioned this way, or the way. It's, it, it, can, it can be the same or it can be the But anyway, a contour is a level line. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't change, it doesn't fall one way or the other, it's level. So we would go in, we'd put a contour across the landscape. It doesn't matter how big it is, it might only be this big, it might be that big. They're only small anyway. We don't build anything big because we're not about controlling water, we're about managing. So it has to be passive. So you put a contour across your landscape, which is helping manage some of that water flow. Then you plant a row or several rows of tree below that. That's the top of your mountain. So if you did that, let's say we're heading up the hill towards uh, Brian, and so I'm on one contour and we're planting a row of trees. From me to Brian, there's another contour where he is. All this section is your grazing land. Plant more trees there. He's the top of the hill to feed this section. I'm the top of the hill to feed that section. You're the next lot, and you're feeding the section in between. So you're just replicating how the landscape built, but you're just doing it in multiple stages. It's not hard. And you know, and you talk about out west. I mean, we run courses out at Miles. We'll be heading out there again this year. It just works everywhere. Everywhere we've been, people see massive results. Because for a start, most of the landscape out there isn't green all year because it lacks vital vegetation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just back you up on that, but the thing is that I've discovered in doing what we're meant to do, as much as possible, is that plants on our ground the whole time. 
Yes. But even in the driest time, I can have a green plant. Yes, of course you can. Yeah, yeah and look, <coughs> the problem is that our landscape is so dysfunctional now. We've lost all the plants that used to grow in the off-season. So there are a heap of herbs and forbs that used to grow in the off-season that are no longer here. Dr. Christine Jones, anybody heard about Dr. Christine yeah. Jones? So she will talk about that. She will talk about the fact that the biggest part of our plant population in Queensland were herbs. It wasn't grass, it was herbs. You could go out there anywhere you like and there are no herbs. Not one. So, you know, they're the sort of plants deep-rooted that will continue to grow, to grow when our landscape is starting to dry back. What Brian's talking about is managing how he grazes and allowing rest behind his animals so that the plants are building a big root system in the ground, which means they will stay green for longer anyway. So all this stuff is very, very achievable. Is that sort of approach to grazing uh, practices part of natural seedless farming? It's not something that we it's not something we talk about simply because um, what we're looking at is how the landscape functions. Okay. So if if you were to put things in order in in the in the order that I think they should be, you would first of all go out and work out how the landscape functions, get that process working, then bring your animals in and that is the way you manage your animals so they don't destroy them. Yep. And it makes you productive, by far. Animals are a key part in all of our landscape, but they, it's the management that's been the problem. Mm -hmm. So you hear all the time that animals are a problem, particularly cows, because they fart and burp and they're causing all this gas. That's all a proper shit. Don't listen to any of it. Because the amount of gas that comes out of the animal goes back, more, than, more of that goes back into the vegetation that's behind them, that's regrowing. Really and it's stored in the soil. So none of that. Look, all of this stuff about plants, sorry, about animals, it's just ludicrous that a cow can eat a plant that was growing there and suddenly it turns that into something that goes into the atmosphere that's killing us. No. That's been going around as a cycle for a hell of a long time. And if the, an animal, like a cow, a bovine, was able to do that, our landscape would have been stuffed years ago because we've had those animals in landscapes not Australia, but other parts of the world for millions of years without causing any of those problems. So we can't look at that as being the problem. It's got to be more deeper than that. And the bigger part of the problem is we don't have enough plants. That's the bigger problem. Any other questions? We're all fed up? Done? <laughs> I don't think you're done. I think what I'd like to do is thank Stuart at this point. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get a line up that might me up. Um, and then I'm going to make a few comments. And then we can bring him back and cross examine him. So, whilst the line is getting ready with the meeting, <laughs> thanks. I've got to say that very many of the key things that Stuart spoke about, I'm in furious agreement with. Almost all of them. There are a couple that I'd tinker with, and we might touch on those. Um, I'm still a mallet, remember? Yeah. You what? I'm still a mallet. Yeah. yeah. You haven't even got a handle on the head there. So. Yeah, but you're probably hardwood. <laughs> no. well, I am there. <laughs> all right. So look, when Rod did his introduction, I just don't know whether people are aware that Slow Food Noosa was created after a demonstration on the intended site of a McDonald's. I think that's quite interesting because there's a lot of people that I talk to that don't actually grab the concept of slow food. The way I look at it is being the opposite of fast food. Um, and whilst I was a primary producer, Kim and I used to have one chicken. But as Stuart points out, she didn't lay any eggs, so I was on a false premise. Um, but I, we tend to look at a lot of um, biodiversity outcomes. So I was very, very interested to hear that. And one of the things we're in furious agreement about is deep time. And to try and, I'm into rocks. And at my place is Philite, named after me. And, <laughs> It's 300 years old. Mount Karura is 28 million years old. 
Indigenous people, 50,000 years. Whitefellas, 250. Aren't we proud of what we've done to the landscape? I'm in furious agreement because the number of plants that have been bowled over, the concrete, the bitumen, I agree, that's what's changing. We just don't have them. And bare earth is everybody's enemy. So that's why I put that picture up. <laughs> it's pretty well the opposite of the sort of stuff you're doing and what we're trying to encourage. That's probably too much to read, but that was a, a slow food thing. I would recommend that you jump onto their website and have a look at those things. Okay, so this is our mob. So what I was going to do is just give you a little bit of a rundown about what Noosa Landcare does and then we'll get into some small projects. So that's the paid staff and we also have about 40 volunteers which includes our management committee. They all don't get paid except I get an exorbitant salary um, as you can imagine. Um, so we've got 58 people on staff, membership's more than that now. Um, whoops. I hope we haven't got timings on this. That's actually a project we're working on with Tourism Noosa. And I'm actually very proud of that. This is Ironman that holds the you know, triathlon and they donate money back to us, which we plant along the Noosa Trail Network. And the reason we're doing that is there's really big erosion there. This is at Twin Hills Lookout, huge slumps. So you'll be pleased by accident, we're planting trees on the top of the hill here. How you deal with slumps indeed. Yeah. And the other one is it's too bloody hot. So the walkers that are on the Noose Trail Network, they're like a fried egg. By the time they get to your place, they're gone. So we're trying to produce um, shade and also it's a wildlife corridor. So we're very pleased that in Noosa we've got a really good relationship with some of these people. Pepper's Noosa was the first, so I've got to give them a wrap. So when we started out, we weren't this big. So we've got three nurseries and we produce around about 200,000 tube stock per year out of those nurseries. And this is the one outside, but I just wanted to make it clear it wasn't always the case. That's what it was like before I started here. You see the outside dunny? That's your office, Belinda. That's the back of our resource centre in town. That's what it looks like now which is the Hinterhub and Belinda's the manager of that. And also inside, there's all sorts of local stuff that's being produced. We found out during the COVID thing, we had to close it, the initial outbreak, but there's a tremendous amount of skilled people within Noosa, particularly in the hinterland, and they produce lots of stuff. And they'd come in and sort of humbly say, I wonder whether anybody would want this. And the answer is yes. Um, so they, do, they weren't, <laughs> Um, salespeople, but Belinda is a salesperson and so is Kira and they come in and I think the people are quite astonished that you ring them up and say can I have some more of that because we sell it. But they also buy plants, 60% of the income in the Hint Hub is still plants. So that's not a dog poo, that's soil. So when I think about the stuff I've been doing for most of my life, I'm always looking at it through the prism of soils. Stuart touched on it. This country has been flogged for years. Dry, we don't have the deep soils that a lot of countries do and relatively low rainfall. And the other thing I'd say is I don't think we've had the respect that we should have for soil. Look at that. You know, that's horrendous. Uh-oh, there. So when Stuart's talking about let all plants grow, I'm half in love with you. That, well, I'm gonna keep working on you. <laughs> that is just abhorrent to me. And I've got to say, most of my experience with um, cows, and you make a really good point about we don't have hard-hooved animals in Australia, but you've got goats and sheep and camels and um, cattle. Horses are probably one of the worst I have to deal with. Um, some of the people, Kim and I live out at uh, Koran, and some of the paddocks, people don't destock horses. They just buy a bit more hay. So what they're doing is chewing everything. 
And as Alana tells me too, cattle have to wrap their tongue around grass to chew it, whereas horses are like lawnmowers. They chew horses right down to the ground. So yeah. Right yeah, that's that's my point. And it, they're, the, they're the most difficult ones that we try to deal with. And also there's a huge passionate thing. I should tell you, Philip means lover of horses. <laughs> and they're a beautiful animal, but I've seen some tremendous damage done. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with horses. Yeah. And I blame them for everything bad in our lives. Oh. But, but none of that was their fault. Yes. It only ever comes down to management. You're exactly right. I mean, no one look into the eyes of the horses and they're a bit like my Labrador. I go all gooey. They're a beautiful animal. This is in Pomona. This is the subway. So this is again about soil. And I wanted to bang on to this a little bit. All that soil is going up to Harvey Bay. And I get your point about planting trees on the top, but I do think we, there's some benefits in planting trees down the bottom too. We can have the debate. This is Moreton Bay and the Brisbane River. That's pretty scary, I reckon. Topsoil is really valuable and it's all organic matter, it's the good stuff. This is Johnson River in a flood. MRCCC have just released a report on the recent floods, the 2022 ones. Stuart mentioned them too, they were a bit north of your property and my property, but the figures that I read in that, the discharge of water out of Munna Creek was actually higher than the 2013 floods. It was a localised event, but it was intense. And for those of, that have lived through the 2011 and 2013 floods, and Robin would remember them, they were pretty horrendous. Yeah, so that, that shot you show there, the Mary River still today is still running soup brown. Yeah. Still. Yeah. And there's been no rain. Yeah. You know, it's diabolical. Yeah. Yeah, so the, new, the Mary River is 347 kilometres long or something. It's a difficult one. Noosa River is still quite um, muddy too. You know, you touched on mangroves, don't get me started. You know, uh, the clearing of mangroves is a crime and we're looking at ways in trying to repair that. We're calling it living foreshores is trying to get it back. It's a bit of a challenge. Anyway, look, keeping it in Kinkin is one of the projects that we run. Um, Bryant knows this one. And the it is soil. Um, kin kin means little black ant. And um, we did some studies, including LIDAR studies. And the LIDAR studies showed, I think it was 2.4 million cubic tonnes of soil mobilised over a seven year period. That's by looking at before and after LIDAR images. There's a good example for what you're saying, is to plant trees at the top, they're landslips. But you also get landslips down the bottom. Do you know why those landslips, landslips form though? Oh, because it's been cleared. The weight of the water is a hydrostatic effect. Why? It's because you don't have the diversity. When you have the diversity of plants, you have the diversity of biology in the soil. The biology in the soil create what's called glomalin, which is the glue that holds soil together, gives it structure. And as the glomalin is lost, soil loses its structure, isn't the part of the problem that it's all been cleared? Yes, because it's lost the diversity. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying there's a little bit more to it. Yeah. Um, so it's the diversity. Yeah. And what I was going on about too is in some of these, and particularly in um, the basalt country at Mullaney, um, Warwick Wilmot was explaining this, and Black Mountain around Karoi is another really good example. You've got impervious basalt deep down with clay on top of it. It gets full of water and the sheer weight means it slides off. What you have, if you've got diversity, trees, deep-rooted plants, it'll hold it in place. Um, I lost a big landslip at Black Mountain when I was there. Um, there was three metre bloodwood in 44 gallon drums of concrete sheared off at ground level. The power of water, as you alluded to, is phenomenal. I also had trees like celery woods moved from me to the veranda, still growing. A whole landslip and they just kept growing. Okay, this is, um, that's another big slump there on the left and gully erosion on the right. That's the Keeping It and Kin Kin logo. They're the LIDAR images that I was talking about. The red is where there's been more than two metres erosion. 
The blue is accretion. So when I say there was 2.4 million cubic metres of soil mobilised, that doesn't mean it's all gone in the Noosa River. Some of it's just slumped. What held the other one, when it gets to the floodplains and the Noosa River, things slow down a bit and you do get settlement out of it. Our, what we've done by doing this is doing a priority to decide where to invest money to try and stop those landslips. Most of it's in the Wundum Plateau, up behind Kinkin. They're the priority areas. We actually need to do that if we want to get money to help farmers do the work. Um, we do small stuff too. This is properties in Kinkin that's associated with the Keeping It in Kinkin project. I know these are on creek banks, but this is a matter of trying to get erosion. So they're just um, people that are part of this project that we can give them some assistance, which is similar to this project that we're um, talking about tonight through Slow Food is trying to give people a bit of a hand because it's tough to do it all by yourself. So if we can supply free trees or a small amount of stuff, and if you guys can contribute around about half of that, then maybe it'll kick you over the edge to do this work. Can I, is that Troy's place? Sure. Is that Troy and Michelle's place? Yeah, yeah. See, the energy that's causing the problem here is down here. That's where your problem is. So when you plant up here, it's good, you know, it helps the bank, but it doesn't stabilise the biggest issue, which is down here. So that's where, so that's where you want to look at. So if you're going to do this sort of stuff, get down here and plant some lamandras and things like that right down on that tail of that bank, hmm. and then managing the livestock, because the, li the management of the livestock wouldn't cause that problem in the first place. Oh, I agree with that, yeah. Um, this is another one. So that what I was saying before was small scale. This is what we call medium scale. This is a job for Sunshine Coast Council. There's a big sporting field here. And what that's done is cleared all the vegetation, created an area that's a, a, a drain. So it's then focused in here. And guess what? You've got a problem. It's always have trouble with any engineers in the room. That's really good. Because <laughs> we always have a problem with a lot of people just funneling water and then you add gravity and you equal velocity and that's where you have the problem. One of our committee members was an engineer and then he turned to become a tree hugger. He worked for Conservation Services and he's done a few roads around Noosa and no gutters on his roads. So the water runs off evenly off the bitumen and then into vegetation on the side. Great. The minute you put a gutter on and a stormwater drain, you're focusing that velocity and you're going to have a problem. Slow it, spread it, sink it. You, you were saying it, just slightly different words. So I agree with that bit. We're getting to the tough bit, it's okay. We do large scale. I don't like that. That's a Sunshine Coast Council job, but we are a contractor. So that's what they wanted and we did it. That was um, Jen's project. I'm not sure, Kim, how many trees was this one? Yeah, 15,000. What, what tree? Pardon? What tree? All sorts. Oh, one thing about us, we don't do monoculture. Um, diversity is the key to everything in my view. This is one... What was the point of the project? Uh, Sunshine Coast Council offset. So just on offsets, seeing as this hasn't been recorded, <laughs> offset should be the last thing you ever do. Don't stuff it in the first place. All an offset is, is making up for a mistake. There you go, I'll be in trouble now. Uh, so you could, I, I, know, I don't know that how the rules work, but just with some communication with those guys, you say, right, no problem, but rather than plant this as one big block, why don't we actually go out and plant rows of trees on people's places and we could cover more of the landscape, same number of trees, benefit the landscape, rather than just block out one big area? I agree with you, but they have done something that they need to offset on their land. It's, you're right, I agree with you. And we do have some really good successes. This one is what I'm leading to. This is private land. Um, and this is a Queensland Trust for Nature and Green Fleet planting. 127,000 trees planted here over five months. But as you see, we haven't cleared anything. We've just interplanted. This is a nature refuge. So it's land that's held in perpetuity, which I really like coming back to my discussion about uh, deep time, we know that these plants are going to be kept in perpetuity. This young fellow at the front has a nature refuge. 
We have a nature refuge. So I know that there won't be a McDonald's on that place. The kids can't sell it. OK, this is our favourite river, courtesy of MRCCC. Um, I think that's erosion. They're camphor laurels. So when it gets to this, this is pretty bad. Um, so there's a company called Alluvium and SEQ Water and Mary River Catchment Coordinating Committee have worked together on this. Really nice people that own this property. And the focus here is because SEQ Water have an offtake at Charles Street in Kenilworth and it's constantly getting choked by erosion. So they wanted to do something about it. So that's what they did, fairly major reshaping of the bank and they're called a pile forest. So their eucalypts whacked into the ground about four to five metres deep and the idea as the water flows past it, sticks get stuck there and you get the word you used in your document about accumulation, that's building it up. What we had to do was plant it out. They put weed mat down and unfortunately they had to compact it, which means it makes it really difficult to dig a hole and also to cut into the weed mat. But we've done that. 8,100 trees on this site and we were out there beginning of the year and actually watching it in the flood was fantastic because you can actually see it starting to accumulate. And it'll be very interesting to see how it goes. Can I say one thing about that? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to stop you. Do you, do you know what it costs? Oh, heaps. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not detracting from the work, but let's just think about this logically. We would have probably 50,000 kilometres of streams in Australia, at least, that are like that. Hmm. So that cost, I think, a one and a half million or somewhere thereabouts, whatever it was. If we take that section as an example of what we're going to do across Australia, we can't afford to do anything. Hmm. So although it, it's, I'm not, don't, that means I'm not taking it away from the project. I'm simply saying it's not the answer. We can't afford it. We've got to look at other other ways of going about it because to be able to achieve that on a small area like that, it looks good, but it's not solving our problem. Yeah, this is a reef project, so this is. No, I, I know. Um, you don't have to explain to me. This stuff goes on. This, oh, yeah. this thing goes on up north all the time, but I just keep. I look bigger, and I look. We can't afford to keep doing oh, all this sure. stuff. We we need to. We need to look at other ways that we can go about. It. I broke something. And so I won't stop banging on about it because yeah. at the end of the day, so everything I look at is how do we scale this? Yeah. How do we make it scale? And if we can't. Then yeah. I understand. So, whilst um, my repair is occurring, I don't know how you managed to do that. Because I don't think I ever done that. Yeah, skill. You are very skilled. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was, can I play now? Um, yeah. So my question to you is, what would you do with that? Well, I'll go back and I'll tell you the same thing as I told you before. The the issue here is there's too much energy at this point here. Yep. And what's, which way are we running here? We're going, we're going down this way. Yeah. So that what's way. happening? For erosion to take place, it must have energy. Yeah? So for that material to be able to be removed from there, it means that the water here, if it's running that direction, has enough energy that it can carry this material away. Unless you manage the water that's leaving this site, you will never fix that. I don't care. You'll come back. That site will be destroyed and one big flood. That will not change it because you're not managing the exit, what we call the exit water. So the water that's leaving that spot has the energy still to carry the material away. So at some point, it will, there'll be an incision come from up here, which will lower the bed, and then it'll go down lower than the structures that they've got on the sides here. It will undercut those and they'll fall in. I think if you had a look at that slot, that last shot, it's already doing it from the last flood. So just by way of understanding, on the left, there is more work that we've done. So we have managed that area below it. So you've but in the bed? Yes. Okay. But I still pose the question, I get your point, but what would you do with that? Would you do anything with that? No, just let it, let it heal by itself. Yeah. yeah. See, to me, that's, I've seen that. That's probably 30 feet of alluvium. And that's why... Yeah. yeah. All right, we'd better keep well, going. If you've got the money, then what you did, fine, no mm. problem. That, 
that's okay, and that's that's probably the best outcome you could you could hope for. But it's just not affordable everywhere. Oh, I totally understand you know, that. On a farming system, if we could go in and batter the banks and all of these creeks and rivers down, we could be far more productive because we've got land that's no longer usable. Yep. Um, we could make that increase. So the moment you take that from being a vertical bank to being a nice gentle batter, manage your animals well, you've now got a whole heap of new grazing land that you didn't have before. Yeah. So most definitely it's more productive. It's just not affordable. What will happen in time is this will start slumping from the top. When it's no longer cutting at the bottom, this will gradually slump down. And what is now a steep bank will eventually not be a steep bank. Mm. You can go everywhere along that river. I can show you terraces mm. on that river that would have looked like that if you were here, you know, 500,000 years ago, mm. and they're not anymore. So they do heal themselves, but it looks pretty unsightly. Mm. I'll keep going. See that spot there? Let's go back. See there? Yeah, we were there the other day, and I think that sticks. That's well, it, is. it is. It's um, lumps of timber that's in a big pile because of the recent rains we had. Keep an eye on it anyway. Oh. There's been a huge amount of damage to the Mary River down through our... Oh, yeah, yeah, I oh, know. Um, okay, this was asked, Rod and Karen were aware of this one, and I just wanted me to talk a little bit about this one. This is Bellbird Homestead. Um, and again, it, it's money, Stuart, but this guy, this area here, that's West Koroi State Forest. Over here, there's other forest, and he wanted to join this up, so it improved his water quality. He does his ration of cows, and he wanted to fence the um, creeks and the gullies and do off-stream watering points. Oh, is this, um, Dix. Dix's old place, though. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not now. It's no. It's, there's a couple of owners now. Um, there, yeah. a month ago. Okay, so this, you wouldn't have seen this, this was very early on. That's what we did. So we fenced it off, did a lot of off-stream watering points. And again, one of the things I agree about is to pull the stock away from the creeks if you can. That's just showing you what it started like. That's what it looks like seven months later. That's pretty good growth, seven months. This here, if you have a look up there, that's really steep and it wasn't very productive for his stock. So we fenced that off. If you dropped a secateurs, you'd go and buy a new pair. You wouldn't walk down the hill and get them. It's too steep. Because you've got too much money in your <laughs> 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 Oh, mate, that was brutal on our staff. It was 36 degrees heat. We couldn't get a quick spray unit up there because it's a lot steeper than it looks. So anyway, it, it was a good result. Now. A few words on weeds. This little crustacean here is a... Nobody knows much about it. It's only in the Mary, um, Cherex punctatus. You see a lot of holes in the Mary, and that's this guy, but they don't know much about it. But we work with many different landholders and partners. Each one has got completely different ideas. When we get new members that come, I'm often telling them to just have a Prozac slow down because what they want to do is put a shed, a dam and a road in and they haven't even put the unpacked the suitcase. But you need to read the landscape a bit. Have a look where the water runs, see how hot it is, what's steep, what grows, what doesn't grow. So I'm trying to tell them just to be calm. I like the fact that it's different but quite often we're managing for biodiversity outcomes. Managing land to increase biodiversity and fauna may be different to a whole of farm management plan. That's why I've liked being here tonight, to listen to how the two can work together. Because, you know, Brian's got cows, Tracy's got coffee. You know, they're all different things, but they're stuff that I use every day, sometimes three times a day. A guiding principle for me always has been you're far better to have some vegetation rather than none at all. So that's where we meet in terms of the weeds that I don't like bare soil. So I'm often telling people and first, is it a problem? People come to me with weed issues and that's the first thing I say, is it a problem? If it's not a problem, do nothing. The next one could be containment. You know, you've got a problem, just keep it there. I was buoyed to hear you talk about thinning because we very rarely bowl everything over. 
but we would thin camphor laurels. Um, there's other techniques of weed control, but I just wanted to make the point that I'm not down on every weed just because it's a weed. I think they are a way to recover the landscape. The way I look at it, and particularly wattles, you get a lot of farmers here that hate wattles. I view the wattles as a scab on a wound. They're the first thing that will come back after there's been a, a damage, and then eventually, like my place, I'm getting um, other rainforest trees coming back now through the wattles. Do you know why? Birds, mainly. No, no, do you know why the wattle is the primary coloniser? Um, nitrogen fixing? Yeah. yeah. So it'll stabilise, it'll, yeah. it'll colonise in four soils, yeah. creating the exactly. for the next yeah. year, Which is what every plant that we determine as a yeah. weed does. Yeah, well, you, we'll get there. Um, but um, <laughs> we've got a bit of, a bit of, a bit of a bit on here. So. <laughs> I'll fight dirty because I'm really old. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so you know, we we did some forestry many years ago, which some of it I'm not that pleased about. But it got to the stage where the guy would knock all these wattles down and then plant eucalypts, and they grow like the clappers. Well, duh, all the nitrogen has been put there by the wattles. Anyway. This is a problem. So just a couple of examples. This is um, uh, Dutchman's pipe, Aristolochia elegans, deliberately introduced here as a garden plant. They're Richmond birdwing butterfly. As soon as they eat that leaf, they're going to die. So a vulnerable species, the biggest subtropical butterfly we have, is going to get wiped out. What is its food source? Para Aristolochia pravenosa. It gets tricked into it. To, so the other one's Aristolochia. Its food source is para Aristolochia. They're in the same genus almost. So is it not short on food? Or is it yeah, because we've bowled it all over. So the recovery program is two-pronged. One is to replant um, the food plant, para Aristolochia. And you said this right at the beginning too, what individual people can do on small blocks of land, they can plant this vine. You don't need Bryant's land to do this. You can put them in a pot. The other side is to thin, get rid of the exotic one, which was mainly planted in gardens anyway. So that's that one. So I just wanted to come up with three weeds to keep you happy. That's cat's claw. This is cat's claw. So I get where you're going, but there are some weeds that we would refer to as transformer weeds. That will never go away. You and I will be dead and cat's claw will still be there. Huge tubers under the ground. The reason we call them a transformer is that they transform that ecosystem into a monoculture of itself. And we agree that monocultures aren't good. So that's one. And where does it come from? Oh, South America, I think. So deliberately so introduced. South America is all cat's claw proven? No, because there are probably natural agents over there that keep it in check. But there's no, there's no monocultures anywhere. So, I mean, you're right. I mean, obviously it's going to be a problem, but... It's growing on dead native vegetation. This is at Polson's Road. Um, anyway, I've just stood off the X. I hope I didn't get into trouble. I don't think I stood on the X the entire time. So I don't find I've got you still, don't worry. Okay, this is one other one I wanted to throw at you. This is Salvinia molesta. Free-floating aquatic fern, deliberately introduced here as an ornamental in 1958. 88 kilometres, more than half the distance between here and Brisbane. I've been to this prop, uh, this is Hawkesbury, uh, 2004. And what you get with that is, the only reason the politicians woke up to this one is because this little town, uh, what's it called? Ah, oh, it'll come to me. They had to stop all their um, uh, paddle wheelers, skiing, recreation. When it hit the business back pocket, that's when they realised they had a problem. This thing, it does have a biocontrol, uh, Salvinia, Certobagia salviniae, which only predates on it. Just on the aquatics, um, water hyacinth is another one. It's been around for a long, long time. But you talked about evapotranspiration. Water hyacinth, you, some people might be aware of it, big long root system. It increases the standard evaporation by a factor of nine. So if your water is a valuable source, 
and so much water is going off through that one. And the other one about it, it has a seed viability of 30 years. Okay, so let's go with the first one. So if it uses nine times as much water, well, what happens with that small water cycle? Yeah. No, what happens? It gets retined, but probably not there. No, it does. It comes back. As long as that plant's green and growing, there'll be dew on it, and it'll be coming back. But just going to these, to the, these water plants, now, you got to, what I ask myself is, why are those plants proliferating? And the answer is, too many nutrients in the water. Oh, yeah. That problem is further up. So by eliminating that, it doesn't solve the problem. So part of the problem is the excess fertility coming into the system. The next thing you can say is, okay, are those plants just a pest? Or are they useful? Right. What if we went in there and we harvested all of that material and we took it back to the top of the hill? Because obviously it likes growing in the water, so it ain't going to grow on top of the hill. Which means all the fertility that that plant has extracted out of the water, we now return to the top of the hill where that fertility can grow more plants. Does that not make more sense? Yeah. It's your old problem that to take 80 kilometres of that to the top of the hill is going to cost a bit more than anybody's prepared to spend. I'm sure there's a way. I'm sure there's a way. You can think about it. Because what else are you going to do? Like, if you go in there and you use it, chemicals is the choice? Is the, is there's one, but there's a major one is biocontrol yeah, for that. that. The other one is harvesting, which is good. This thing can double its size in two weeks. Yeah, it's good. Uh -huh. Really good. That's a great plant because it means that you can harvest a lot of fertility out of the water and move it. If you've got the cost and the money to do it. The other one is it blocks out light. We've still got to go back, no matter what we're doing, we've still got to work out where the fertility is. Yeah, you will, but you, you're never going to do that, Stuart. You're never. If once these things are in, Kabomba is another example. Are you familiar with Kabomba? It's an attached aquatic that we've got 64% of all the Kabomba in Australia and Lake McDonald. There's no way we can get rid of it. We can manage them. That's why I'm with you in terms of thinning. And you're right, if you could put that up the top of the hill, that'd be great. But the cost is enormous. If you don't stop the fertility coming in, you're never going to stop the plant. Sorry, guys, I might have to wrap this up a tiny bit. <laughs> We're running out okay. of time, sorry. All right, so in summary. You shouldn't have given this up. I know. <laughs> in improving biodiversity, which supports diverse fauna, builds resilience. Native vegetation on farms can increase productivity, provide shade, increased pollination, natural pest control, better soil health, better water infiltration, <laughs> erosion control, water quality, carbon storage. We may argue about the bottom one, but I think you'd be okay with most of those dot points. Yeah. You see the guy here? He leaned against that tree and he pushed it over. No, about two months after this photo was taken, the tree fell down and I told the poor bugger that he'd knocked it over, he was shattered. Um, I just wanted to put that up. That's in Upper Pinbarren in 1950. So before you go home and dive on your secateurs, because you're all upset, we're actually not too bad now compared to 60, 70 years ago. There was some incredible aerial shots of this country, which was completely cleared. Um, there's unfortunately, there are not many places left in Australia that haven't been cleared. Oh, I agree. Most of Totally agree. There's um, a road off Karoi Noosa Road, I'll stop after this, um, called Covey's Road. And I actually m met Merv Covey many, many years ago. And he went to this meeting with me and he had a smart lady from the um, university come out and said, oh, this is the best old growth forest I've ever seen. And Merv said, yes, it used to grow good vegetables too. It was his father's veggie garden. There's just about no remnant vegetation in our area. There's a, a few bits on volcanic mountains where they couldn't get to, that there's a little bit left, but it's all been worked over. Anyway, look, I, I thank you very much for listening to my part of it. I'm handing it over to you. Yes, <laughs> you want my pen? No, no, the <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, everyone. All right. I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time. Thank you all um, for coming tonight. So um, part of tonight was actually to uh, showcase one of the programs. 
that we are running in conjunction with Slow Food Noosa and Tahuin Park um, training slash forage farms. Um, so as Rod um, explained earlier tonight, um, we have created a grant program out of some funds that have been um, directed towards our local producers here in um, improving productivity, but also to improve our environmental outcomes as well. So um, how many of you guys are actually slow food um, recipients of the snail food of approval? Awesome. Cool. So this is an, um, this particular grant program is actually eligible to um, snail approval um, recipients um, only at this point. So if you are unaware of that particular um, program happening at the moment through Slow Food Noosa, I um, urge everyone to go to their website. There is a little bit of um, background information of what they're doing and what's part of that actual um, program. So it's both producers and rest restaurateurs um, coming together to promote um, sustainable um, food production. Um, so together with Slow Food Noosa, we are rolling out this particular grant program and um, we are providing uh, four, gr four grants of $5,000 to um, snail approved recipients um, and that is to go um, towards um, farm improvements whether it be productivity or environmentally or collectively as they both as we have found out tonight they align very well um, and the main thing with this is that um, with the five thousand dollars that you have to um, bring five thousand back to the table in the form of either in-kind labor or contribution through materials or the likes or it might be like financially through um, obviously money. Um, so our funding areas that we are wanting to address are native veg vegetation enhancement, nutrient management, erosion control and remediation, soil health, water cycle management and pasture and grazing management. So it covers a wide range of activities that you could actually implement on your property. And I hope tonight sort of gives you some direction where you might want to um, go as with your farm, whether it be, you know, um, looking at uh, farm um, improvements through uh, certain structures or even um, developing um, farm plans for yourselves. Um, so if you would like to go onto the website, there's a little bit of information on the program here. Um, and then obviously what um, the program looks to support. As I mentioned, um, the funding will support up to 50% of the cost of the project and landholder support can be in the uh, both financially or in kind labor. Then um, we've gone through and done the guidelines for the, the grant. So it just gives you a bit of direction in terms of what we are um, looking in terms of um, your grant application. And it goes into a little bit of detail, so you can um, apply for a minimum of 1,000 to up to um, $5,000 towards that grant. And there's certain things that um, you can't obviously um, use that money for, um, and that is outlined in the, the grant um, guidelines. We then have an online um, grant application um, to fill out, so nice and simple, and that then goes to um, Slow Food Noosa, my, ourselves as Noosa Lanka and Stuart, and we come together and actually select through our criteria who will actually receive that funding. Um, so if you want more information about it, we do have an information flyer at the front as you enter the building, um, but also head to the Slow Food Noosa website, there's all the details there. And again, if you're not a member of Slow Food Noosa, have a look on um, their website to see what they're all about and whether you'd like to join. There are um, going to be ongoing you know, perks of being part of um, Slow Food Noosa as this is not just a one-off grant program, it could be continuous um, if successful. So yeah, keep that in mind. Um, and feel free to chat to Rod or um, Jason further about the program in terms of the slow food nosa side of things. Um, myself um, and Kim from admin of Noosa Lanka will be managing sort of just the administration side of the, of the application. So if you have any issues with the application and whether you think, is this actually appropriate or um, am I filling out the form correctly or anything like that, you can contact us. We're more than happy to go through it with you guys. Um, 
but yeah, if there's any questions, please let me know. What I reckon is it'd be good for you to go on the website and have a look at it, and then if there is some questions, we can, Alana can solve those. What I would like to do is thank Stuart and Megan and Rod and Karen and Jason from Slow Food Nisa. I learned a hell of a lot from listening to your talk tonight. Um, I think it was interesting because I don't think we're that far apart um, in the core of what I tried to achieve. Well, you kept trying to draw us apart. <laughs> <laughs> so would you join me in thanking Stuart very much? Ends proceedings. You can all clear off. <laughs> can I, can I just have, I, there was something I meant to say before. I know I don't know. That's um, and the thing is that one, I wanted to, you know, I'd like to thank Slow Food News for this initiative because, you know, if if somebody doesn't step out to try and make change, then we're not going to get any change. So I think it's fantastic what what they're trying to do, and I'm honoured to be involved in it, and I'm always happy to help out in any of these areas. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, apart from what we talked about, where you know that you can plant a plant, there's other components, and Slow Food News, this is what it's about as well, and that is supporting local farmers. Mm. And, you know, if you don't go out there and support local farmers, or farmers that are trying to do something different to, you know, improve their landscape, then we're not going to get the change that we need. And so all of these initiatives, that's what it's about. That's what we're trying to do at Forage Farms. It's about show people what you can do. So you can improve our landscape. You can restore a degraded piece of land and get production at the same time. You can do it. You just have to understand how and how you can create a dollar at the same time. But for us, for our business, the only way we get to make money is that people buy our product. And, you know, that's the hardest part of our business. And I find... It's interesting, uh, I can't remember the place on the coast, but they talked about it. it's only just down the coast near Kiwana, and it's got a medium house price of 1.8 million. Mm. Yet a lot of the people that live there probably buy average quality products. Mm. And that needs to change, you know? And I call people out. I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to see people saying, oh, I'm doing it, because you're not. This has the ability to change our entire landscape, our entire environment can be changed just by how people spend their money buying food. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the slow food um, movement is helping do that. But you guys need to talk to your friends and engage everybody, because the only way this is going to happen is by you. You know, I'm... Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs>